So this is the Amarok, and it's a 12 inch knife, comes with a taper tang. And the uh, knife handle is Goncalo Elvez, which is actually curly or figured wood that you'll see here as I move the wood. You'll see how it's got kind of a sheen to it. Yeah. On both sides. That's beautiful. And the knife pin I put in this one was a mountain with a moon and some trees, pretty indicative to places like the Pacific Northwest. This is all silver with a brass moon. And that design goes all the way through. So no matter where I cut this pin, you'll always see that. And can you show them that tapered tang again? I really want people to see that. That is beautiful. Sponsored by Midland. Communication for every adventure. The industry leader in radio communication technology and innovation for over 50 years. Sponsored by MyMedic. First aid kits that will actually save your life, not just band-aids and gauze. Sponsored by Timbo Tusk. Sponsored by Trail Rated Coffee. Sponsored by CK Knife and Tool. Always remember, the opinion you follow should be your own. Just consider the things stated here to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Hi, I'm Phil from Waypoint Overland, and you're listening to Random Waypoints. All right, so here we go. Welcome to the second season of the Random Waypoints podcast. This week, we have a special guest, Chad from CK Knife and Tool, now in Gillette, Wyoming. Welcome to the show, Chad. Right. We're very honored to have you. Oh, it's nice to meet you, finally. All right, so let's have since, an official uh, shake on, on, on camera. Since uh, been following you like we were talking about earlier. Right. Fellow Chicago and you're talking yeah, about right. our food. and. So let's get right to it. Tell, tell my, my um, watchers, our viewers, where you were born and raised. Uh, born and raised in Chicago. Spent uh, about half my life there. You know, going to Michigan, Wisconsin. Then when I joined the Marine Corps, I left, then went back, and then ended up in Washington, where again, you have to be. Right. <laughs> I was just talking Phil here. He doesn't know it. <laughs> so, did you grow up off-roading and traveling? Uh, grew up camping, grew up hunting, and grew up riding three-wheelers back in the day. Okay. Dirt bikes and stuff. Never had any idea about Glamping, camping, overlanding, any of that other stuff. Never would have thought I could afford it, let alone think I'd get into it. So so when did you first start hearing about overlanding? Uh, probably, <clears throat> I'd have to say probably around 4, 2016. We actually ended up, uh, 2014, we got a fifth wheel. And the kids and I used to all go dirt bike riding. And my wife and my daughter had seizures and we gave up dirt bike riding. So we wanted to do something else. And we got into some of the uh, bushcrafting and camping. And then my wife didn't want to do any of that. So we ended up uh, just fell into overlanding by accident. And I was like, I always wanted to get a rooftop tent. It's like, oh, that'd be awesome. And uh, then just went on from there. It's a rabbit hole, isn't it? It sure is. It sure is. <laughs> Okay, I want, I want everybody to know the real reason why I'm here. So let's get right into okay. what you do. I, tell my audience what, what it is that you do. I'm a custom knife maker. Okay. I make handmade custom knives, both hunting, bushcrafting, uh, kitchen knives, stuff like that. And uh, I got my start actually doing it. Just wanted something to make to pass on to my kids. And uh, once I did that, it was almost like the overlanding bug that bites most people. I got into making my first knife, and it just kind of meshed with me. And I made a second one, made a third, made a fourth, and before you know it, I just turned it into a business. Well, I already know the answer to this question, but for the sake of this podcast, could you also tell us what you did before that? 
Um, was a third generation tile setter. Then I went into the Marine Corps, got out of the Marine Corps, went back to tile. Wasn't really doing it, I was missing the niche. Went to school with my GI Bill, the enjoyed gotten law enforcement, and was a law enforcement officer for 10 years. Okay. And then I gave that up to basically homeschool the kids and take care of them. I had a contracting company on the side, so I had something going all the time. And then I got into knives. So the way that I know you is through social media. Uh, you follow me on Instagram, yep. and then I saw your videos. I followed you back, and I fell in love with your with your knives, and that, that's why I'm here. Uh, so I just wanted to mention how we know each other. I always like them to know what Oh, yeah. No, actually, I actually found you on YouTube by happenstance, going through, you know, overlanding stuff. And my ran into yours. It was probably maybe the first month or two you might have been in. Mm -hmm. And I watched, and the first thing I said is, that sounds like he's from Chicago. I was like, that's cool. And then I just kept, I just subscribed and watched videos and stuff. And then I got an Instagram and I found you on Instagram then. And then just, yeah, just blossomed from there. So social media is a, it's a, it's a really cool platform for a business as well as just for personal. It's also a rabbit hole too. And it, it can be mucked with a lot of bad things, but it's got so much positive. I try to keep people towards that positive. Yeah, when, when I first became aware of you and what you do, uh, you were still, you were very close to me. Uh, yeah. So tell them about your recent move, where we are, and what your plans are moving forward. I uh, left Port Orchard, Washington, and my little shop, and I moved out here to Wyoming. Um, one of the biggest moves basically was the taxes and business, freedom of business, and low taxes, low income tax, actually no income tax here, uh, and then low sales tax and stuff. And then a freedom, we wanted more property, and it was just getting too expensive to stay there to expand the business. So I moved out, picked Gillette, Wyoming, and uh, bought this, bought five and a half acres, and the building was here, but it was just an empty building, a dirt floor, and turned it into what we're seeing now. And the goal was is to build a bigger business because, uh, like you've seen, I want to not just keep, continue teaching knife classes, but also give back to the veteran community because there's a lot of vets that, there's a lot of companies that do stuff for vets. But I think a lot of vets get left behind because there are certain things they can and can't do if they're in a wheelchair. So I made a goal that when I came out here, built the business back in Wyoming, everything was going to be mostly handicap accessible to where a person in a wheelchair can come here to the shop and make a knife with me in a wheelchair, adjustable tables, all that. What, what are some of the other things <clears throat> that you've done specifically for, in, you know, to uh, facilitate the handicap? And, um, not just, just... Like I noticed, I noticed the um, up front, the bathroom. Yeah, the bathroom is handicap size, ADA required, double doors that come in and out of the shop. Every other uh, grinding room is 36 inch wide door. The grinding room is twice the size I had before for someone to man you know, maneuver around. Poured all the concrete. So even in the wintertime, if someone has come out, they can back right into the, the garage, drop down, and it's all concrete. They can park out in a gravel drive right by the walkway that's 11 feet wide. Mm -hmm. And they can use their wheelchair that way too. And ladies, I want you to know, it's a very clean, very nice, large bathroom. So you lady veterans, uh, he's, he's, he's thought of you also. Yeah, my <laughs> wife makes sure I, I keep dot the I's and crossing T's. And then just recently, actually, um, I was gifted a motorized wheelchair. So now somebody came out here because my knife class is five days. Unlike some people that, that do blacksmithing. You can kick a knife out in a day. I don't do that. My knife process and the steel I use, it's a five-day process. Slow curing epoxies. The slower the epoxy cures, the stronger it is. Day of heat treat, stuff like that. So there's some downtime. So I actually have a motorized wheelchair that if somebody didn't have the ability, they can take that, that chair like the Devil's Tower, and they can go up that way and use that motorized wheelchair to get around if they needed to. Okay, so the way mm -hmm. I know you is through the 
Overland community. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know you in, in the Overland community. Could you talk about some of the connections and uh, people you work, you've worked with? Uh, I know you have a, actually one of your popular knives is someone very well known in the Overland community, but I'll let you, you talk about that. Yeah, actually, um, I got into the Overland community just by happenstance again, and I uh, started reaching out to other YouTube creators like myself, and one of those YouTube creators was actually uh, Coyote Works and the bushcrafting, and then he got into the Overland community himself. And I started working with Casey. We designed his first knife, and that was uh, uh, the main knife here was the, the main Coyote Works bush knife that Casey and I designed together. Um, and uh, we did that, and um, we got that going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't want to cut that. That's razor sharp. And, and this will go right through it. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful sharp. knife. Uh, so we started making that, and uh, uh, this went off really well. It's been one of the top three sellers that I've had. We did that, and then in 2019, we launched, or 2020, we launched a second knife for them. A little bit smaller for the women. This is my favorite. I know you said it's for the women, but this is my favorite. This is more EDC to me. Yeah, the actually, that outsold this one now in regards to everything. So this was called the Coyote Pup. Mm -hmm. That was the bush knife for the 1.0. This became the Coyote Pop from there. And I've been making those for Casey for a better part of, uh, I think, three years now. So was it, the, was it, the, was the, was it these two particular knives that kind of propelled you into the Overland community? Yeah, that was probably the best way to put it is um, I had some touch with the Overland community because some people that were Overlanding were also hunting. Mm -hmm. So that brought me into there. And then the fact that I made some kitchen knives. A lot of the guys like to take care of their wives. You know, they're out there doing stuff. Hey, my wife likes to do this, but I want to give her something nice. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the husband's got all this other stuff. And the wife, wives sometimes feel left out. So I had a couple of husbands hit me up for kitchen knives. And then, yeah, it worked pretty good. Okay. So my audience, they know that I'm more interested in the owners of these businesses and what kind of people they are. They know I'm also more interested in, um, do you actually make the products or is it just something you slap your name on to? Um, uh, so talk about that. <clears throat> yeah, we, um, um, I started, I, I buy bar stock material made either in Canada or the United States and I make every single knife here in house. And the only thing I ever get brought in are materials like the Kydex material, the leather that I use to make my sheets, uh, my pins, the custom pins you'll see on some of my knives, like on here with the uh, mountain. There's a mountain and a moon on there. That's a really big hit for the outdoor community. I get those made by somebody else. But, um, yeah, the leather, all the materials come in here. And then when I get it all... This knife, when it's done, it's made by me. If it's a leather sheath or a Kydex sheath, ferro rods, I buy the ferro cerium, I get the antler or the wood, and then I make everything here in the house. So I pride myself, mostly everything I buy, I try to get made in America. And it's also important because in 2020, I was actually made one of the Made in America movement ambassadors. So oh, wow. trying to, you know, push the five key things was made in America, was it made local at the time in Washington? Uh, is it family owned business? Is it federal owned business? Firefighter, law enforcement? Those key things I've always kind of focused on. And I think that's what got the made in America movement people kind of involved in what I do. And uh, trying to push more within the community in general. I uh, love it. I love it. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. That's why I'm here. I, I, wanted, I wanted you to have an opportunity to, to say something like that. Yeah, we, need, we need more companies like that that are more focused like that and are giving back like that. Yeah, small businesses and stuff. It's kind of important now than ever. So we like to get philosophical <laughs> around here. What do you wish you had known then that you didn't know now? It doesn't have to be about the knives. It can be family. It can be... I've got one for every carry. Okay. One for every category. <laughs> oh, what I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known that I should have had an MRI 
rather than an ultrasound, uh, an ultrasound for my neck and my surgery, things might have turned out differently. Um, moving to Wyoming was tough and getting everything going, especially in uh, 2021. It would be nice to travel back, you know, 12 months or 10 months from now and tell my one year younger self, don't buy and move in 2021. It's not the best for lumber. Uh, so some people <clears throat> watching already know who you are and they're, something that they probably want to know is what's going on with the voice chat? Oh yeah, the, I know I didn't used to talk like this. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had surgery uh, back in uh, May of uh, 2021 had surgery in May, and it was for a uh, thyroid tumor. And when I joke about the MRI or the ultrasound is, when you go through it, it's basic for ultrasounds to see the tumors and to do it. And uh, they turned around and found out it was four and a half centimeters big. I think that's what it was, the measurement was. And so I had to go in for surgery. But when they went into surgery, they found out it was over three times the size. Wow. It was wrapped around my esophagus, my carotid, and uh, it went down to my sternum. And during the surgery, I ended up finding out I had nerve damage. So it actually cut some of my vocal cords and stuff, and they got some of it back together, but I'll never, I can't yell. I can't uh, speak very loud anymore. Uh, I get strained. I can't speak very long sentences. I run out of the way of pushing that air out because I'm trying to speak from more down deep and not using your your regular voice like people would use. I understand. So it gets kind of tough. So Wow. <clears throat> so I know you make kitchen knives. I know you make bushcraft knives. What I want to know on a personal level is what's the knife that you carry every day? What's your everyday carry knife? Oh, actually, it's in my truck. It's in my, <laughs> it's in my rig. I have a little go bag. It's a little bit smaller than my Pelican case there. It's a little go bag, and it's my Rogue. Okay, we'll, so, we'll take a picture and pop it up right yeah. here, right now. Okay. Yeah, it's my Rogue. Actually, I totally forgot. I left the kitchen knife in the box down here. Forgot to pull it out. Uh, my favorite kitchen knife is the Kiritsuki. That's okay. the one I oh, use the okay. most. And then after that, it's a Santoku. Those are my two go-to knives. But uh, my knife in my pack is my Rogue, one of the first ones ever made. And then my second knife is actually a Jasper. Okay. It's right there. Okay. Um, so as far as your... I, I knew you when things were rolling. Everything was pretty much doing well, and you were expanding into this big, gigantic, huge shop that you've got now. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show you a, a quick little tour of it. He's not done with it yet, but I'm going to show you a tour of it. This place is huge. Uh -huh. Yeah, we just kept so, on building this table. What what kind of hurdles did you have to overcome to get as far as you've gotten to this point? Uh, the knife industry is tough. And getting a name out there is tough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then a lot of it's, there's a lot of people that make some beautiful knives that are collectors. Right. Then there's people that make really low-cost, quick, easy knives. And it was my goal to try to fall in between them too. My knives aren't cheap, but my knives aren't expensive. My knives can be real pretty with the woods and some decorative pins, but they're not so extravagant that you don't want to go out and use it. Um, it's that fine balance right there. And then it was just getting your name out there to let people know they can trust you. And I think part of it was having a connection both with the military and my Marine background and my law enforcement background, having those two niches helped me kind of get in and just kind of force a wedge, you know, my own little wedge in the knife community. And then using YouTube and social media kind of helped quite a bit to kind of expand from there. So, and what has been the response <laughs> back from the military community uh, to you jumping into the knife business? It's been great, actually. I had, uh, when I started trying to teach classes, I had uh, three people come out to the shop that were all former Army in one way, shape, or form that made their knives. And it also helped that my mentor was retired Army. He was a Special Forces. 
he ran first group down in uh, JBLM over in Washington, where we're from. And uh, so it was all that niche that came in there. But it's been really good because the Rogue was really popular with them. The uh, Jasper was really popular with those guys. And then it was the connection I ended up making with the Warrior Boat Society. That being John Love, Lovell, that being a former ranger himself and getting connected with them and the infancy of my business and making knives for them for a while was pretty good. So actually I got one of her, one of her knives right here. It's called the, we called it the STPT, the stabby, thrusty, pokey thing. Yeah, this feels nice. I mean, nice. And, and I designed that with, with uh, Evan over at the Warrior Boat Society. So, And again, that's what's nice is priding yourself to be able to work with people that have an idea. Like with Casey, that I do with that, uh, Warrior Boat Society with this. And then um, Kit Badger being a former Marine, YouTube personality as well, more in a tactical industry, but Ivan and I designed that knife together, and we call it the Woodsman Shank, and I was selling those on the website too. And again, they're Ivan being a Marine, uh, John being a former Army, and then my knife mentor, and all these other guys getting together, so that community was really good. It was really tight. Okay. I want to talk about the kitchen knives. Yeah. Because... Um I'm going to get the the um, name wrong, but you said you make a, a kursu... Kiritsuki. And I know it, it's a <laughs> Japanese cut. And then you said, uh, what was the other knife? Santoku. Santoku. Yeah. So both Japanese-style knives. Yeah. And from my understanding, um, it's a little harder to, to make those type of blazes. Am I, am I right in that? If you're going to forge, yes. I'd love to. My next goal would be is to get another maker in here, and I want to do forging for my classes, for everything that give, give everybody experience on all aspects. But when it comes to blade steel, uh, I'm using D2 for my normal knives. I use stainless steel for those. And a lot of the kitchen knives you'll see out there are, are carbon steel. They're more of like a 1085, 1095. Guys will do pattern weld. Damascus is what the generic term is. Mm -hmm. They'll do pattern welded uh, materials and stuff like that. That can be a little bit more daunting. Uh, to make a Kiritsuki or a Santoku, one of my kitchen knives, it's usually about 10 days in that process. One of these wow, is ten days. five to seven, yeah. One of those is 10 days where um, that's if you don't, the heat treats a lot more in depth. So you can ruin steel with the warp. Mm -hmm. Then you got to re anneal it to soften it so you can work it again and get it back into place. But uh, the Kiritsuki is nice. It's 12 inches long. They get longer. Uh, sometimes people make smaller ones for taking on the, the rigs and stuff because, mm -hmm. you know, when you're overlanding, you're, uh, especially you with a Jeep. <laughs> yeah. Space. Yeah. Space. Space is at a premium. Yes. So shrinking the knives a little bit is kind of nice. Um, so <laughs> what's your favorite knife in the kitchen? Your kitchen. Um, actually, yeah, the Kiritsuki is my favorite. And then the Santoku. I've got big chef's knives. I seldom use them. I usually go to either my Kiritsuki that I made, most likely, or my Santoku. I'm a Santoku guy. Uh, I like the other other blade, but um, I try to avoid the, the uh, pointy fronts. <laughs> yeah. The pointy tips. I've made standard carving knives, chef's mm -hmm. knives, and I've done some carvings, some 13-inch long carving knives before. Mm -hmm. I've done that, but uh, they're not that popular. It's the Kiritsuki and the Santoku. That's the, probably the Coyote Works knife the, for 1.0, the number one sale. The 2.0, number two sale. Then the Kiritsuki would be the third. And then after that, it's a bounce between either like the Chimera or uh, the Jasper. So. Okay, I, I want to stick with the kitchen. You know, we like to eat This is here. Philip is going to be watching this one. Huh? <laughs> That's cknifeandtool.com. So... I want to know if, if uh, I was meeting you somewhere on the, on the trail and you were making something to impress me, what's your go-to impress meal on the trail? Oh, I love carne asada. Oh, really? Okay. I love carne asada. The kids and I, we all do it. My second one is... So number, carne asada tacos or burritos? Or? Just, I'll put on anything. I'll put it on breakfast burrito. Mm -hmm. You know, little, just little tiny six-inch mm -hmm. or four-inch round tacos. Yeah. Anything. 
I bring the carne asada, throw it on the grill, it's quick, easy. I just love the flavors. After that, then it's, I love burgers. I love burgers. Okay. So, I've been eyeballing those Timbo tusks. I haven't gotten one, but I haven't been out. This year's been kind of taken. I haven't been able to go do much uh, overlanding this year, so. Yep, I just over, left Overland Expo. Shout out to Jerry over at Timbo Tusk. That's a good yeah. friend of mine. I love that guy. Yeah, Jerry hooks up uh, my buddy Charles. It's a venture with Roscoe. And uh, Charles is always on that Timbo Tusk. He's always rocking it. I know exactly it. who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Charles is always cooking meals and doing stuff. Yes. I need a big Timbo Tusk. Like a big one, I could do like a bulb. Because September 11th, I'm doing my open house here. And I just got like a camp chef, little flat griddle mm-hmm. to do my carne sat and stuff. But I was just thinking I need like a, like a bigger Timbo Tusk. You know what? You know, as like popular a, as they are, I, I could definitely see something like that coming in the yeah, future. Like the house. Yeah. A Timbo Tusk for the house. Yeah. I'd pipe that off of a, you know. Or, or maybe one with, you can remove the dish so you can. Oh, yeah. Because the Timbo Tusk now, I think, are what, 12 or 16 inches? I think it's a little a little larger than 12 inches. 12 inches, yeah. I think tw- it's about 12 inches for the... Can, I should know that, but I don't know. Well, my grill's hardwired, mm-hmm. hard-piped, my gas. I'd have like a 20-inch, 20 24-inch Timbo Tusk right next to it. Just hard gas to that, and oh, I'd be scottling like crazy. And my audience is going to want to know what you drive, and how do you, how do you get out when you, when you get away? Um, I'm like the odd man out. I've got a Nissan Titan. What? Why actually, do you say, wait, 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 <clears throat> wait, 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 wait. Why do you say, why do you say that? Because I'm out. not like these guys. Everybody's got Jeep. Oh, Everybody's no. got Toyota and Land Cruiser. No, we're not like that here. That, I, 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 I drive what fits me, but I judge no one else. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been in some of the craziest remote places, and I'll see all kinds of vehicles. Yeah. As long as you get there, you get there, right? I like okay, and I, I wish that people would get that through their heads in the community. It's not a Toyota and Jeep thing. It's it's whatever no, it's you not. whatever gets you there, oh, and it's yeah. not all about off roading. It's 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 traveling and enjoying yeah. everything in between the points instead of just driving miles and stopping and driving miles yeah. stopping. Yeah, when I went out to Nissan, uh, Nissan USA, I went out there in 2019, Provost, Utah, mm-hmm. Park City, Utah to drive the 2020 Nissan Titans. Mm-hmm. And uh, they got a hold of me because of I was turning my rig into overlanding. I was trying to get it out there in the community because mm-hmm. there's not a lot of aftermarket stuff. Right. And that's where it comes in. Having a Jeep, you know, you can find so much stuff. Oh, yeah. Toyotas. And that's why guys like me get jaded and razz people like you because we get left behind in that. Yeah. And it's not until this, probably this last year, some more of the aftermarket stuff's been picking up a little bit. But I did a lot of stuff with uh, either myself or just trying to find people. I built my own storage box in the back of my bed, but I had a buddy of mine over at Offer Warehouse down in California there. He hooked me up with a suspension system, so I put that on myself. Um, I put some RAM mounts. It's the first person, actually, from when I found out the RAM or the... Nissan Titan is a dashboard. There's like some kind of speaker or something that would be there mm-hmm. on the Platinums. But that's I got a cover in mine. Took that cover off and I bought a RAM mount aluminum track. And I mounted my mount so I can put my GoPro and my Garmin, my phone, everything. I can mount it right up there. Oh, great. And because there was nothing for that. You know, Jeep, you guys got those. You can get like bars mounted. Right, all kinds of stuff. Toyota's got all sorts of things that mount. Mm -hmm. And Nissan didn't have that, so I did it. And I've gotten emails and messages from people. They love that. It was like a simple little, you know, RAM isn't the cheapest thing in the world, but the actual screws and the idea, I didn't spend more than five bucks to actually just do it. We love hearing stuff like that. We love hearing stuff like that here. Yeah. We're not about spending money just to spend money here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like when you were like, you're not part of the Jeep or the Toyota. What impresses us? Um, and and it, you're, you're starting off our, our second season if you didn't know it already. I didn't know until you did the, <laughs> the intro. I'm like, 
Okay. Well, there's going to be a bunch of rig walk-arounds that focus on uh, bought, not built vehicles. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm trying to go against the grain of everybody that, you know, they're flipping a brand new vehicle every six months. They got a new trailer every six months. So we're, we're trying to go totally opposite direction in that here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was one of the things when I got with Gowana Equipment. When I connected with Gowana Equipment and they made me a brand ambassador, I was looking. Yeah, some of those, some tents are awesome. Those rooftop tents are just amazing. But I didn't want something I couldn't afford something that flashy. Right. And I ended up with the, the Wanaka 3, and it fit me. And as I was telling one story, it can put me and one of my Marine buddies up there. And then when I got that annex, I can sleep my wife and I up there. My wife and kids can sleep in the annex. And it was not that expensive. Right. Or like that, that awning I got, the Morpho. Mm -hmm. They gave me the walls for it too. And you can get into stuff like that. If you can't buy a rooftop tent, get yourself an annex or like a like a 270 degree awning with walls, because then you can you've got an area you can sleep in, but then you got an area you can prep in, and then you got it's big enough that you can put a couple of cots in, protect yourself from the elements if you wanted. You can set it up for a bathroom, you know, if your wife or the kids need some privacy. Those those 270 awnings are awesome. All right, we're back from a tour of the facilities here at CK Knife and Tool here in Gillette, Wyoming. And let's talk about that. How, like, what kind of square footage are we talking here? Because this joint is huge. Yeah, yeah, I took a, uh, a dirt floor shop that's 40 by 64, and we poured the concrete, did all plumbing, electric, everything. The workshop itself is 30 by 40, and the uh, knife room... And the wood shop we're sitting in are divided by the bearing wall and like the grinding room right there. So this area here, what I like to do is have just use this table, spread out leather to make sheets, plan, have round robins, have you know guys coming in and gals just want to sit back and just chill, just talk about stuff. Have this 50 inch by 98 inch table to relax around. Uh, still have to finish the media wall. Got that going, and then uh, give people an experience with wood and with leather on this end. On that end, it'll be all knives, steel, drilling. More the violence of action is over there. It's like grinding and stuff. It's very loud, noisy, dirty work. But uh, you told me on the tour that you were thinking about even a, a second location. You want to talk about that? Yeah, this is the this is basically kind of like a test. Uh, I went from a, my old building was less than 20 by 20 <laughs> on my two and a half acres. And we bought five and a half. And now uh, this building is 40 by 64. But my shop here is tripled in size. And I want to do that because of wheelchair accessibility. But I want to make sure this all works well. Because my goal would be at 55, you know, in five years from now, a little bit over five years, I could have a shop in Wyoming in Gillette. And I would have a little storefront, and then I would have a bigger building in the back where I can run classes with five, six people, have two or three people working for me, helping people out, do that, do full-on, you know, veteran get-togethers there, go back to my roots again and do law enforcement things, blue line stuff. I, I made a knife years ago for the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. I'd love to get back to that again. And this is kind of that, kind of the test to see how it all works out. If I can keep my sanity in whatever hair I have remaining. So go from there. And then it, it also segue into the nonprofit we're working on. So talk to us about the nonprofit. The nonprofit's gonna call it Maintain the Edge. And uh, I came up with that name because as veterans get out of the service, and I've been out since 93, you know, to date myself, and I didn't do anything anywhere near what our vets are seeing now. But what, I, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from a lot of them is when they get out, a lot of them got to find a purpose still. You know, PTSD has been a big thing. And it's a lot of that has to do with the idle hands, not putting, not uh, diminishing the experience, but it's such a high speed, low drag lifestyle 
Then when you get to civilian life, a lot of guys are trying to find what to do with themselves. Keep their hands busy. If your hands are idle, your mind starts to work and wander. That's never a good thing. So in maintaining the edge, I'd like to try to get people to maintain that edge. Whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you've got prosthetics or not, whether you're just having a, a challenge coping. Maintaining the edge, not just physically, like we used to have to do push-ups, sit-ups, the PT stuff. You know, you're keeping your scores on the range. But that edge of keeping mental sharpness and acuity, coming out and, you know, using a table saw, using a scroll saw, you know, coming out, make a knife, use tools, and get that brain functioning again. Get creative. There's all these different edges. And it was also a spinoff, being a knife maker, to maintain that edge of your knife. But it was more for the fact that I wanted to get guys and gals out to get back that edge again that they think is, you know, they might be getting a little softer on the midsection. They might not be PT like they used to. They, they might not be challenging themselves as much. I had hoped that I could give them that opportunity to get back into it. And then they might like to, sorry about that, uh, my, about my shop mascot. It's a real uh, shop. It's a real shop. It's a real Wyoming. Uh, it's also maybe you might find someone that wants to make a knife, not just once, but two, three, four, five times. And that's the guy I'm looking for too. So it's self-serving because I can get someone to come in the shop and say, hey, I'd love to work for you then. I want to dig a little deeper into the transition of a veteran from the military and either retiring or coming back. I want, I want to get from the outside looking in. <clears throat> on, on its simplest level to me, it's a person at one point was one of the most important people to the safety of their country. And then the next day it's just like turned down to zero. Uh, nobody knows how much you've done for your country. Uh, speak on that some more. Oh, well. Talk about that transition. Because I don't think the average civilian really understands how different, how big of a jolt you go from, from almost being like the star of the team to, to a nobody. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. that's. But I'd like to hear from a veteran. Yeah, well, Ted, I felt it twice. I felt it when I was in the Marine Corps. Because I got on the 90s, and they were just getting rid of everybody left and right. They were just cutting back the military. So not only did you <clears throat> get out of the military shorter than what you might have wanted to do, but then you're being told that you're not valuable anymore when you're getting out. So then you get out, and you're used to this expectation of yourself and the expectation of people around you. And I got into civil. I went back into contract work with my dad. And I was dealing with these guys. They didn't have that level of expectation of themselves. Right. Excuse me, of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that frustrated me because I had this expectation of myself. And if I had the expectation of my own body and my own mind, mm -hmm. I held it on you. And that just drove people crazy and pushed people away. And then, you know, you got to come to terms of that. But I was always, again, I got into construction. I was always working. I was always making things. I was always busy. And so that's what got me back to that maintain the edge. And then when I got out of law enforcement, I, you talk about, you know, like I was a rifle officer. I did elder abuse. I did witness protection. I did all these things that nobody ever knew about. Most people still don't know to this day. And I got all these accolades and these awards and all this other but once you become a civilian, it don't mean anything. Nobody cares anymore. My wife always teased me because I had frames with, you know, certificates and diplomas and accolades and attaboys, and I had my office. I don't have any of that anymore. It's all in a box put away. So <laughs> that could be a traumatic thing for a person to come home and be responsible for so many things, multitasking, uh, suppressing stress, doing all of these things that sound like tr should transition into a job as an asset, right? Yeah. And then you've got a, a guy, maybe he's the boss or he's just the person interviewing with you and he's looking down on you. Uh, the next step I want to, uh, next thing I want a person to visualize also is 
Um, there are some stereotypes out there about military that are inaccurate. And when you just post the numbers versus the average American, they're actually lower. But there's actual stereotype out there like, oh, you might not want to hire him because he'll come and shoot up everybody or, or blow the place <laughs> up. or you, you know what I'm saying, right? Oh, so, so speak on that because that's, that's really not the case. It just seems like the, the rare time it does happen, they, they make sure to put it in the news. Yeah, I remember it was probably a lot more like that in the 90s. <clears throat> Excuse me. Back in the 90s, early 2000s. Then you start getting people that are somewhat sympathetic to vets now. But you still get that to where they look at you a little. And I hear from the younger guys not coming in. Because, again, you know, I'm 49, and I'm getting guys that are 30, 35 years old. And like, yeah, I'll go do an interview. But you're just too gruff for that person. You're not so soft. They want you to be more soft-spoken, more accepting of people, differences. But in the, the flip side, that double edge. The person telling you that isn't being accepting of who you are and not being compassionate of what you've just seen and did for four years or eight or 20 years. And so, yeah, you can you can get that still. So those vets are finding themselves narrowed to certain categories of jobs they can get. Construction, maybe work at a gun store. Um, maybe every once in a while you'll see a couple of them working at a Home Depot or something like that, or a Lowe's or a Menards. But they don't get to be, they're not given an opportunity to be customer service orientated because the military doesn't teach you. They said, hey, when, like when I went in, here's your job, it'll transfer to all these civilian jobs. I did that. I get out to a civilian job. It didn't pay my no, next to nothing. And you're basically just gaffed off again. I'll give you this. If you don't want it, then you can get something else. Well, vets don't want that. You don't want to get out and, again, be sit there and go, I had a good-paying job in the military. Yeah, sometimes it wasn't the best. Sometimes it sucked. But it was good, but I couldn't stay or I had to get out or it was just my time. But now you want to feel that purpose that you felt there. And employers aren't giving people that purpose. And it's not just being warm and fuzzy or hand hand holding and big hugs. You want a sense of accomplishment. That vet doesn't care less if you give them a pat on the back. That vet wants, at the end of the day, to feel like they did something right. They felt like they they helped someone. No, no, no. I can definitely speak by myself. We don't say that we want attaboys every day. I don't want every month to be you know, employee of the month or something like that. I just want to go home saying, I feel accomplished. I feel like I did something. Whether like with me, I got back into trades, I felt accomplished because I was building things. I was making things that people enjoyed. And that's something I'd like to maybe try to do. Um, you know, working a desk isn't for everybody. Not everybody likes it. I'm not of that personality. I find myself at a desk more because of what I do, all the admin stuff and the editing videos. But and another thing from the outside looking in that I've seen is, is that um, mental health for men is, is starting to become more uh, acceptable, I'd say, in the last five yeah. years to say, hey, things are, uh, I'm get, getting a little too deep into it. I, I need some help. I need to talk to somebody. But we still haven't gotten where we, we need to be. And I think part of that mental health is if, if, if I hire you and I give you purpose, uh, if I, as a customer and I see you and you, you're working there and I treat you the way you should with respect, that's, that's going to help you with your mental health right there. Yeah, yeah. But I do advise <laughs> you to, to get help and don't be ashamed and no one should make shame of you. I just wanted yeah. to say that. Yeah, I go back to, I give my kids stories like my grandparents grew up during the Depression. So I tell my kids about the stories of how it was like to live in Chicago during the Depression. Mm -hmm. But I also talk about, when you look back at the World War II vets, they had, you're looking at Normandy. You're looking at, 
airborne units dropping from the sky, landing in country. They didn't even know where they were at, trying to find their way around and do stuff. Some of the most stressful moments with some of the lacking of technology versus what we have today. Those guys and gals came back, especially the men, came back after World War II. Just, I couldn't even imagine what it would be like. But what did they have? They, most, most of those guys that came back, they went back to coal mines or oil mines or building high rises in Chicago and New York and Philadelphia and steel plants. They started having purpose again. They started working. They farmed. They worked. They did things. They created. Many people in my grandfather's time were very, very creative. They didn't buy everything. They made what they had. <clears throat> they, had to, they were still thrifty with a dollar because they came back after dealing with all of what they experienced. They know what it was like to go without. And I think now it's a big thing is giving those guys purpose, giving men and women that are serving, coming back, not just to sit around, collect a VA check, go talk to a meeting once a week, and that's it. You're getting 80, 60, 80, 100% disability. And most people won't employ you with that. What are they going to do? They're sitting around watching the news. Who wants to watch the news now? Oh, my goodness. And then, again, idle hands. The mind starts to wander. You go back to the bad times. Give them something to do. And like a job like mine or others, this isn't, you got to be here 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You get two 15-minute breaks and a half-hour lunch. This is, you come in and you work. You're creative like this. Be creative, get you know, and then also be like, hey, I got I to gotta get going. I got to take it easy to then do that because you're someone that understands. Some employers don't. Some employers can't. You know, I'm not going to bash them for it, but I think more employers have to. You know, I do too. Give them that break. Give them that little. I want to talk to you about Chicago. Oh, the food. But before we jump into Chicago, <clears throat> I want to talk about Wyoming. Now, you've kind of, kind of covered that uh, taxes, finance, and business mm-hmm. type thing was a lot of the impetus for you coming here. But if a minus that, why would a person want to live in Wyoming? Tell me, tell me, there had to be other things involved with you saying, hey, I want to live here. Well, the standing joke is uh, there's more animals than people in Wyoming. There's actually more cows than people. Wyoming has less than 600,000 people. It's the second least populated state. It's one of the five largest states, I think, but it's the second least populated next to Alaska. Um, I've had enough of big populations and, you know, big cities. I, I didn't want that anymore. I didn't want all that. I don't, I can go without. I don't need to be by big strip malls. I've never been a big strip mall person. I don't need to go to the theater because, well, in my own personal opinion, I don't like giving people a bunch of money that have a very contract, contradicting viewpoint of my own. I, yeah, I use YouTube and I have Netflix and I have all other stuff, but if I have somebody telling me I'm a bad person because of my way of life, being former Marine or law enforcement or whatever, I'm not going to give you my money. Just like I've had people that may, may not want to buy a knife from me, may want to buy a knife from somebody else. I'm okay with that. I think that's awesome because there's so many different people like us that can do that. And so I'm like, enough of people. I just want to come here, have my acreage. Loud music is over there, 10 acres away, 20 acres away. I'm good with that. So it's the lack of people that was part of it. You know what the irony is of everything you just said? That all those choices to be able to buy from you or buy from someone else all these uh, all these different choices you have, ultimately they wouldn't have gotten them unless there had been a veteran willing to fight for you yeah. to have that opportunity. Yeah. A lot of the people that uh, have complaints whatever direction they are I just want them to remember regardless of whatever your yeah. whatever your argument is, whatever side you're on, you you can't have a side other places. I, mm-hmm. I, I've traveled the world. You you, this is a very unique place that you oh, can yeah. actually get on YouTube or Instagram oh, yeah. or just 
yell it out downtown or something. Yeah. They'll snatch you up in some countries. Yeah. So I just want people to at least understand oh. that. Keep complaining, but just yeah. realize why you can complain. My wife's from Poland. Okay. She's got more in common. My grandmother just passed away this year at 98, 99. She was 99. Sorry, Grandma. Uh, but she had more in common with my wife uh -huh. being born in a socialist country, Poland. My wife used to tell us stories. She would tell the kids every beginning of the year they'd get a little card from the government and her family for every family member. That card was for a new pair of shoes. My wife's a year younger than me. She had one phone in her town oh, wow. of like 200 people. She grew up where there's only one phone in town for the longest time. Yeah, that's, that was, that's crazy. Growing up, learning how to can and have a farm and raise your animals and do all that. Yeah, so when she moved here, it's like, yeah, it's, you don't, you're very grateful for what you have. Well, you know I'm from Chicago, but my family migrated to Chicago. They're originally from Arkansas and Mississippi. And so I, I totally understand that. I understand town after town, each right. uh, with all outhouses. And now, I, we have working plumbing in Wyoming. <laughs> Just saying that. Phil's making it sound like we don't. We're not that backwards. He made I, me go outside to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that bathroom was nice and clean. Uh, but we got, hey, we got Menards. I've got Home Depot. We have movie theaters. We're like 35,000 people in Gillette. And that's what I like. It's a small town atmosphere. Uh, it's I, a small town, but I had some excellent sushi downtown. See? I mean, we got a, we got a couple of awesome steakhouses. Old Chicago does pretty good pizza. I had a good calzone from old Chicago. Um, and if you're trying to get an idea of where we are, uh, he's about an hour and 15 minutes away from Devil's Tower, which is probably the most famous, iconic and, monument in the whole state. So, and my you, sales tax, to get the Gillette to kind of put it out together, my sales tax is 5%. Oh. I have no state income tax. If you're a veteran, there's no income tax on your disability. There's no income tax on your Social Security. If you're a veteran and you're a resident after two years, you call the county, they give you a discount on your property taxes. Uh, Home Depot still gives me a discount. Um, the Rising Edge Services, the electrical company, and Renegade Plumbing both gave me discounts on building this to support, because there's some of the supporters. Um, I'm working with the high school. I'm gonna join with this high school for marketing, advertising, help them out with the high school. But it's huge. I mean, my high school, the kids are at now, it's 1,200 kids. That's big. But when you go there and how they deal with stuff, it's just it's so small town and community. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that's how they keep Gillette. And that's why we picked Gillette over something like Cody, which I liked. Cody's beautiful. I got a buddy, Dave, who lives up in Cody. He owns a Proud Cut Saloon up there. And yeah, shameless plug for you, Dave. <laughs> Um, but Hi, Dave. Really nice guy. He's a transplant from East Coast. But uh, it was, again, moving out here. We wanted that kind of environment. Uh, lots of blue collar. A lot of people are really thankful. Uh, recently, uh, there was a Marine that actually died in Afghanistan. He's from uh, Bo Boudrant. I think it's, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that. I never even heard of it. It's uh, just south of Jackson Hole, mm -hmm. Wyoming. The town's like 100 people. Wow. And uh, he was killed in the, the attacks that happened a couple of weeks back. Uh, so, yeah, that was, it's really, they were really half, half mass flags, you know, anthem, all that kind of stuff. That's how I grew up. And that's why I wanted my kids to be back in. So, not the big city, even though, as they were saying, I miss Chicago food and I miss the Chicago skyline. I don't care where you're from. Sorry, I'm going to insult you, but Chicago's got the best skyline of anywhere by far. It's, yeah, and some of the best food. You're not going to get an yeah. argument out of me. Um, so what, should, what, what would you, if, if I snapped my fingers and we were in Chicago right now, where, where would you want to eat? Oh, I want Gene and Jude's. I want a super, I mean, a... Uh, uh, Italian combo oh, with hot peppers, yes. juicy with some fries. 
Dipped or not dipped? Dipped. <laughs> dipped. And then I want an Italian ice next to it. I have a, I'll have a, like a Dr. Pepper or something, but I want Italian ice for dessert. Okay, me, me, my wife is from Chicago too, so we, we, we play this game like every other day, and we always have some taste for something. Mine is usually for Harold's chicken, uh, Pepe's tacos, <laughs> or uh, Eduardo's pizza. Eduardo's pizza, okay. And just to be clear to my audience, it's uh, even though they sell deep dish pizza, it's a thin crust pizza. Get the thin crust from Eduardo's with spinach. Yeah, thin crust is awesome. I like deep, deep, deep no, dish I too. Do. My wife's a thin cruster. I make deep dish pizza. I actually got a cast iron skillet. Okay. I use only for my deep dish pizza at home. Now for, yeah. for deep dish, I'm a Mal Malnati's guy. Lou Malnati's, yeah. yeah. I used to go up there to eat all the time. See, we're a little different. I'm a north sider. Phil's more south. south. So, see, but I'm a Cubbies. But he said he'd go Cubs. I'd go Cubs, too. See? I used to walk up to the Wrigley Field. I used to walk 10 miles to go see the Cubs play or take the CTA. Well, when I, when I lived in Chicago, um, you know, growing up, the White Sox Stadium really sucked. Yeah. And when they, when they transitioned to the, to the new one, one, yeah, that was nice, but you didn't want to be around there. It, <laughs> But if you go around there nice, it's real yeah. nice around there now. No, probably, yeah. Yes. It's been probably, oh, it's been a long time. I remember when they tore it down. Mm -hmm. Because when they were building the old one, they tore it down. I was dating a gal that lived in that neighborhood. Because she was going to UIC. And all oh, that neighborhood was not good. Well, you can walk from catchy. the stadium all the way to, do you know the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology? Yeah, yeah. You can walk from there all, all the way to the IIT safely through beautiful homes. Oh, things change, man. <laughs> things change. But, and a second food would be, I miss Chinese food. We had a Chinese place down off of Harlem, Madison. It was awesome. Now, it was really everybody's going to think, think I'm being biased when I say this, but Chinese food in Chicago tastes completely different oh, yeah. than everywhere else. Yeah. And I don't know why this is. I don't either. I had Chinese food in Seattle. Mm-hmm. It was nowhere near as good as Chicago. Now, you would think, in case people don't know, Seattle is a huge hub. For Asian hub. community, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you would think that the best Chinese food that you ever ate would be there. Yeah. Or maybe uh, anywhere on the West Coast, you would think, before Chicago. Yeah, now I never, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was down in San Diego and all that. I never had any Chinese down there. Mm -hmm. But I know that there would probably be a couple of good places from what I heard. But I don't know. I've never ate there before, so. But yeah, nothing, nothing beats Chicago food. Even the, like, Italian sausages. Yes. Hot dogs. Hot dog buns with poppy seeds. Yes. I mean, how hard is it, people? Come on. Hot dog seeds with poppy seeds. Well, we, you know, we used to be the meat capital of the world, right? Yeah, now. yeah, it was. And I think we, we still, we hold that pride. We may not be the capital anymore, yeah. but... Um, we hold that pride. We have a lot of sausage makers, a lot of Frankfurt yeah. makers. You remember Portillo's? That's actually, when you were talking about uh, the dip roast beef, that's actually my preference. I like to go to Portillo's, me and my wife. We used to tile the restaurants. Oh, really? Yeah, my dad. Well, you, you know, they're the big kahuna now. They, oh, yeah. They, um, my dad buys it on phone on the line. Mm -hmm. He doesn't do the internet. He calls them up and he mails Portillo's to us. Oh, okay. And when we get out of here, I got to show you they um, all of the big city restaurants, the famous ones you know, there's an online place that you can have all that stuff shipped to you and then you can cook it at home. Like the, like the um, I don't want to say the nickname because it's not politically correct, but I can't think of what they call it. The place people used to go to get um, sausages and smothered uh, pork chops. Mm. Um, on Halstead. Oh, oh, gosh. They used to call it... I can't remember now. Something that. Town. I don't want to say that. <laughs> trying to think of the name of it now. The J Town. Yeah, I can't... Okay, we'll let I that was go. There, I was there probably, well, I haven't been to Chicago in, since 2012. Oh, you got to go back then. Uh, 
it's not safe it, anymore. It's, it, there's so many changes. Yeah. They Dude. didn't, they just finished the waterfront. Mm-hmm. Finally. When we went there. And I'm trying to think what else was still going. I think, I don't even know if the Sears Tower, I think it was still the Sears Tower. Because it's Willis Tower now, isn't right. it? It was still a Sears Tower back in the day. I can't believe they sold out. Well, you know how you said they completed the, the, the complete Lake Shore? Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that that's a plan that has been, they've been attempting to complete since oh. the, the original daily, not the son, oh, yeah. but the yeah. father. No, Richard Sr. Right. Yeah, back in the day. Well, most people don't even know Chicago. Most of the Chicago waterfront is built in landfill. Right. <laughs> it's like, like and it's standing still. Well, and, it, and even if you go back further, it's swamp. Yeah. And Chicago means stinking onion because that was the only thing that grew in these swamps. Yeah. Yeah, my grade school that I went to, my dad went to, my mom went to, my cousins, my, my uncles, we all went to that same school. My grandmother was the first graduating class oh, of wow. Dever School. And she remembers when it was built because she said it was built in a swamp. They used to take logs and stuff and fill it in. That school's still there. Still standing to this day, yeah. Yeah, I think I think actually State Street yeah. is like the border of where the ground actually starts. Probably. Do you remember when it flooded? No, you were already gone. No, it, when it, we had that flood. Uh, I was gone. Okay. Yeah, I was in Seattle. I was with Seattle PD at the time. But I remember because a friend of ours lived off of uh, uh, River Road, East River Road there. Her apartment, she had a ground apartment. The entire thing was flooded. All the way up to the ceiling. Yeah, Franklin Park, River Grove, all that area in there, Rosemont, all that started getting flooded. And it was funny too because they had the deep water tunnel project going. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't open it. They weren't opening those. They didn't want to open them. And they were afraid it was going to be damaged. <laughs> it was, they built this big tunnel underground. Right. You guys don't know. It's like, 15, 20 feet tall, these mm -hmm. huge tunnels to take water runoff. Right. To be in these big tunnels. During the big flood back right. then, they didn't open the tunnels. It wasn't complete, but parts of it was. Right. But they wouldn't open it because they were afraid of damage to the tunnel system. So everybody flooded. That's a shame. It was our irony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't even know if they're even finished now. That's like a 20, 30 year project. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't keep up with those things anymore. But I miss Chicago. It was fun talking to somebody yeah. about my hometown. Yeah, I miss the food. Was... So look, Chad, tell everybody how they can get in contact with you if they want a knife. Um, I'm going to, after we're done, I'm going to take some pictures and stuff for everybody to see. And I know somebody's going to want to yeah, get right, a knife from you. Yeah, right now, it's all, always, it's always cknifeandtool.com. The best way to reach me is either through the website on the contact, and then uh, Instagram. Those are the two best things. You can do cknifeandtool at gmail.com or sales at cknifeandtool.com, different ways. But uh, the books have been closed all year. I've got, when the shop opens up, the September 11th is the open house. I'm hoping to take just a couple weeks off because I've been at it six, seven days a week since I moved in January, since we did this process, uh, filming video, building that thing, the whole nine yards. But uh, October 1st, I'm going to start production on eyes again. But I'm going to fulfill the orders of people that have been waiting a year, fulfilling those orders. Then I'm going to start making knives to put up on the website for sale for Christmas. These would be pre-made knives. But if you, you know, and then after that, the website goes live the 1st of January for orders. But it's always six to eight months for knives, because I get, I can put all my knives that I've made 20 some different knives, because if you go on the website, it's kind of challenging. It's because I have over 3,200 varieties with knives and styles and everything. It's a little daunting, but it's cknifeandtools.com or just type in cknifeandtool on your search engine. You'll get everything, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, the website, everything, you'll get it all. And just let me talk to my audience for a second. Um, people who have bought custom knives six to nine months, that's actually a pretty, 
that's a good turnaround time. That's pretty quick, actually. Yeah, so I just want to educate those who have never bought a custom knife. Uh, that's a, you, that's that's a very good turnaround time. Uh, there's some people that are literally a year to two year wait times uh, for for their knives, and they're just being honest with you, their quality is nowhere near what yours is. Um, we're going to have to talk about some of the little details about your knives. Like, uh, do you mind? Oh, go ahead. Uh, like, just like, for instance, this knife, I don't know what you call it, but you did, you, it's just not a full tang, but you've even taken the time to take the full tang and have it you taper. taper. Yeah, taper tang. Talk, yeah, call, tell me what it's called and talk about that, please. Yeah, you, that's how I learned. When I was taught by knife mentors, like there was only one way to do a knife, taper tang. And so I do that, and you do it by hand. You just got to do it on a grinder. And that just gives you that sharpened look. First off, it's aesthetically pleasing. Yes. Because it takes a lot more time in the process. And also it helps with balance. Because if you look at a knife like this, like the Cowdy Works knife, this is 10 and a quarters. This is 12. This is out of the same thickness steel and everything else, but... This one is a full tang, and the weight of this knife is a lot more than this knife. And it's because of that full tang versus a taper tang. And I, I love Coyote, Coyote Works knife. This is a beautiful knife. How thick is this? Uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch. Wow. That's nice how I started way. out, yeah, you want. Same another, as this one. Another thing that I wanted to mention is you don't have it on every knife, but... A lot of your knives have like little logos and and, and, and decorations and uh, the little pins. Sometimes mm -hmm. you ha you have decorative pin pinning. Um, you're not just giving me a chunk of metal stuck in some sticking some Macarta handles on. Yeah. And th th this is craftsmanship. This is artwork. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I want to emphasize that to people. Um, yeah, the pins are custom. I've done company. I've done knives for. Icon Vehicle Dynamics, Kit Badger, Coyote Works, Warrior Boat Society. I get them with, I've got like 40 some pins that I keep in stock. And initials, people's initials, different colors, branches of service, done different pins for Special Forces, Marine Corps, the Army. Um, I got an Air Force pin, stuff like that. So, so here's my next question for you, because I'm a knife guy. And a lot of times when I buy a knife, I'm already order, planning and ordering or looking up where I'm going to get my, my um, sheath from mm -hmm. because usually they just kind of give you a throwaway knife cover and that's what they're expecting for you to do is to actually... Yeah, some makers, they'll sell you extra. You'll buy the knife and they'll wrap it mm -hmm. and put it in a box of military and you got to get a sheath. So do made. you have somebody that you recommend mm -hmm. for... for um, your knives? No, I, I make all of them in-house, and uh, I've actually had people mail me knives. So you do you just do Kydex? Leather, too. Oh, you do leather, yeah. too? Okay. Yeah, this is actually, Kydex is a thermoplastic. Right. Generic, it's like calling acetaminophen Tylenol, but then I use Holstex, which is like a leather-type material. Right. So it's still a thermoplastic, but it gives you the, the leather look, and then I just do leather. And I do, I do all the stitching by hand. I'll do all the tooling and everything by hand. So, and I'm self-taught. I never had anybody... Uh, now, I knew you did this. I just was kind of yeah. setting you up to, to tell it. But, and, but I just want my, my, my people to, to understand. This is not just some little crap. This is... The cases for... The sheaths for your knives are work in themselves. The thickness of these sheaves just themselves, the, the quality of the leather, it, there's a firmness to it. It feels like, um, you know, a lot of people don't want to have a leather one in like a, a rainy area, but yeah. this will hold up. And it's not, of course it's not gonna stay looking the same, but as it ages, the quality of these kind of, of uh, sheaves, it's gonna look better. Yeah. And I wanna <laughs> go back to the art, artistry of your handles. If you're carrying one of these knives, people are going to ask you about your knives just when they see the handle. Yeah. Just when they see the handle. That's the goal, right. is the wood. Like, this is uh, kind of curl. This is Goncalo Elvis. Figured Goncalo Elvis from Mexico. That's Coco Bolo. Okay. This is Madagascar Ebony. Mm -hmm. 
that's stabilized, died stabilized, spalted maple. And then I just got regular uh, micarta. But I've done everything, maples, wood, all different types of woods. And the wood is a fingerprint. And I can make, I can make 50 or 60 of these knives even with Coco Bolo, mm -hmm. but every piece of Coco Bolo is different. Right. I can't make the same Coco Bolo to try. I love that. And that's what gives it its uniqueness. So when you buy a knife, not only are you buying a knife that, okay, I want a Cotterworks knife. Okay, everybody else has it, but I want it with Madagascar Ebony. I want these pins. I want this brass. I want this nickel silver, carbon fiber, stuff like that. There's different ways you can make that knife yours. And then there's etching. I do etching on the blades and stuff like that too. Electrochemical etching, I can do that with names or something. So again, it's making your knife yours. And that's, you're paying money. You're not buying a cheap knife. Not, not buying a Gerber. It's not paying Taiwan. It's not a cheap steel. You know, it's, it, it's T2 or it's C, CPMS 35VN stainless steel so you're you're buying me spending 40 or 50 hours making this knife on top of the materials and so uh yeah <laughs> and that's you got to put in perspective people are very quick uh going to a store and buying some now chad <clears throat> i want to thank you it was an honor interviewing you anytime that i can have the opportunity to showcase a veteran who's giving back, who is as talented as you, who is uh, doing something American-made. It's an honor for me to have you on the podcast. I so I want to thank you for that. I appreciate it. I got to meet somebody popular. <laughs> I know. I've met someone popular now. <laughs> okay. I'll have him autograph the whiteboard. So I'm going to talk to my audience for a second. All right. And then we're going to get out of here, okay? So all I really wanted to say is, guys, if, you, if, if this is your first time here, then you don't really know who I am. But he, if, he wouldn't be on here just because, just because. If I'm interviewing you, that means I like you on some level. I've, I've seen you on social media. I've checked out your product. I've heard good things about you. And I'll feel proud about showcasing what it is you do. And this is one of those people. Um, he makes quality stuff. It's made here in America. He's helping veterans. He's expanding his business. He also has a YouTube channel where the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call this? The shop. The, the, shop, shop. That he, the shop that he's working on. Uh, he's, he gives you updates. He talks about not, you talk about all kind of stuff. So I advise you going go to check out his uh, YouTube channel, even if you're not going to buy a knife. Thanks again, Chad. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right, everybody. That's another episode of the Random Waypoints podcast. And with that, I want everybody to stay safe, tread lightly, and hopefully I'll see you here or on a trail soon. Thanks again. <laughs> You have been listening to Waypoint Overland's Random Waypoints. Like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more.